Welcome, everybody. My name is Marie Leverett. I'm the coordinator of Women's and Gender Studies, and I'm very happy this afternoon to welcome you all on behalf of a group of us, actually. So, the Women's and Gender Studies program, the MFA in Writing, the Department of English, the Interdisciplinary Center for Culture and Creativity, and the Women's Center. This is our winter 2014 lecture in the new Feminist Research Lecture Series. And in case any of you have not heard, uh, just a few weeks ago we received University Council approval for a graduate program in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies to begin the fall of 2015. So um, it's lovely to be able to make that announcement today. Very, very <laughs> This is our fifth lecture in the new Feminist Research Lecture Series, an initiative launched initially to highlight the cutting edges of feminist research by contemporary non-tenured faculty and public intellectuals who are making significant contributions to local, regional, national, and international debates in the field. Um, because it's our fifth anniversary, I think this might be the last time I get to just enumerate everybody who's been here so far, um, or I might just have to do it in five-year cycles. But uh, just to give you a sense of this lecture series, our first presenter was Dr. Ilya Parkins from UBC in Okanagan. Her talk was entitled, Timing Femininity in Christian Dior's Self-Fashioning, and it read um, <laughs> Dior's designs as an autobiography performed um, on the gendered bodies of others. Um, we tend to keep in touch with the people in the New Feminist Research Lecture Series, so Ilya is actually organizing the National Coordinators Meeting of Women's and Gender Studies units at National Congress this year. Our second presenter was Dr. Jasmine Rolt. She's now an assistant professor of culture and media at the New School in New York. She presented a talk called Mediating Affect in the Queer Americas, Cases of Creative Resistance, and she's currently working on a feminist and queer digital archive. Our third presenter was Trish Salah, who's now at the University of Winnipeg. She spoke on gender struggles, trans organizing, trade unionism, and radical communities, analyzing the role of labor movements in linking transgender justice to the struggles of working classes and colonized peoples around the world. And for those of you who know her, um, her wanting in Arabic was just nominated for the Lambda Prize. Um, last year, Dr. Tiffany Mueller Myrtle was here. She <coughs> holds the Ruth Wynne Woodward Chair in Gender and Urban Studies at Simon Fraser University. Her talk was called Emerging Feminist Urban Futures, drawing on her work for an organization, Women Transforming Cities. And uh, she's been instrumental in bringing feminist urban geography to national mayoral meetings <coughs> in Canada. So, um, this is an august body to be joining Melanie, and we're so pleased to have Melanie Chanel with us. She's presenting a talk on her research process and writing. It's entitled, Recounting the Truth of War Through Feminist Fiction. And we're very delighted to have Melanie with us for many reasons. Um, as one of our own celebrated writers from Saskatchewan, she models the ways women writers are taking up the role of public intellectual, engaging some of the most difficult and vexing challenges that arise as women continue to work for gender justice from many different social positions. Um, in our geopolitical global era, informal economies that um, basically uh, organize combat criminal and coping economies under neo-colonial imperialisms lead to ever-expanding small arms trade and investments in civil wars, often organized around issues of identity and sovereignty. Sonera Tabani warned us that this would be the result of new waves of militarization in the 21st century. Melanie uses the power of feminist fiction to bring the lived impact of these realities to public consciousness and shows that none of us is ever very far removed from the concentrationary zones that characterize living conditions for the majority of people on our planet today. As we prepare to launch our graduate program, I could not help but notice the telling role of a feminist graduate student um, whose research project carries the protagonist into the heart of the Sudanese civil war in Melanie's book. And of course, I love this book, <laughs> and I would recommend that you avail yourselves of the opportunity to get a signed copy after the lecture. Um, and just to recap, Melanie is going to be talking to us today about the research that she did in the Sudan 
to uh, prepare for her award-winning novel. She'll discuss her quest, how to come to know the women there who've been embroiled in a decades-long war, her understanding of women's roles in war, and how her experiences informed her novel thematically in terms of women understanding their positions in relation to one another. Melanie has lived not only in Saskatchewan, but Vancouver, Toronto, Boston, Colombia, Thailand, Kenya, and the Sudan. She holds a BN in English and an MFA in creative writing. She's written for television, published fiction, poetry, and nonfiction, and has won awards for her work, including the Saskatchewan First Book Award and the City of Regina Award for While the Sun is Above Us. As mother, educator, and public intellectual, her work inspires us to consider what might constitute mindful, non-coercive, transnational solidarity. Here is Melanie Schnell recounting the truth of war through feminist fiction. Thank you, Marie. Um, <clears throat> I'm honored to be here, and thank you so much for inviting me here to speak today. Um, I have to begin this talk with a humble confession. I did not even know I had written a feminist novel until I had almost completed writing While the Sun is Above Us. I was very lucky to have as my thesis supervisor the esteemed Canadian writer Lisa Moore. And after her first read-through of one of my later drafts, her main and repeated comment was, this is a story about women in war, is an obvious statement, but it was a revelation to, re revelation to me. I don't know how many of you are writers in this room. How many of you are writers? OK, so quite a few. Um, it's only now that the novel has been published in a way from my intense gaze for two years that I see strong feminist themes at play in this book. I was so much inside of my characters while I was writing and while I was researching that I found it practically impossible to step back at the time and take a wider view. I only knew of the Dutes and Sanders stories, my two main characters, their struggles, their connection to each other, um, the traumas they'd endured. I was thinking of the story close up. I was only interested in these women's lives. They, I'd become a part of them and they'd become a part of me. I wasn't thinking of writing this story as a feminist act. Sometimes as writers we are so close to the story that we can't see the bigger picture until later. i had been so focused on the details and the characters and hearing the women's stories when I was in Sudan that I hadn't stepped back and that, you know, I had to see that this indeed was a story about women in war. And not only that, I have come to learn that a story told about women in war is very rare. Storytelling is important. Storytelling is necessary. We know that storytelling has been around since the beginning of time. It is how we have shaped and how we continue to shape our cultures, our politics, our identities. We do this by telling stories through the media, on the internet, on television, in movies, in books. Recent studies prove that reading novels can transform an individual in a permanent, profound way. Story is how we frame and build ourselves, and by extension, our world. It is how we evolve. What is also important and what is also necessary is bringing women's stories to the forefront. In terms of popular culture, the Bechtel test comes to mind. Has anyone heard of the Bechtel test? Okay, great. Um, the Bechtel test, for those of you who don't know, the Bechtel tests the presence of women in movies. It asks the following simple questions. Are there two or more women in the movie and do they have names? Do they talk to each other about anything other than a man? It is shocking how many movies do not pass these simple guidelines. Most blockbusters do not even come close to passing this test. This speaks volumes about women's role and visibility and significance in the main narrative of our world. <coughs> women as main characters, women as a central, essential figures in stories are rarer than having men at center, and the stories with women at center are rarely told in war. From what I have understood from many readers who have contacted me after reading my book, this is actually the first time that they'd read a story about women in war, anywhere, not specifically in Sudan, not in Africa, anywhere on earth. I don't think I need to expound to this educated audience that globally women experience marginalization, poor access to health care, poor safety, and are often extremely affected by war, yet their stories are hardly ever told. Bringing women into the forefront in fiction is a feminist act because it places them at center stage instead of in the margins. Way back in the year 2000, I read an article in Maclean's magazine that changed the course of my life. 
It told of the slaves of Sudan stolen as a weapon of a long civil war. For decades, Northerners had been destroying and looting villages in the south of Sudan and stealing away the women and children to be kept as forced slaves and concubines in the north. After reading this story all those years ago, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I tore out the article and read it again and again. And soon afterwards, a Sudanese woman waltzed into my head, demanding that I tell her story. A Canadian woman followed soon after, and their insistent desire to connect with one another became the force that drove me to begin writing this novel. So I wrote and I wrote, and then I realized that if I was going to write a novel set in Sudan with one of my main characters, a Sudanese woman, I would need to go to Sudan. I went back to the article and looked at the names of the people who were featured, a couple from London, Ontario, who raised money in their community and then took it back to Sudan to buy back captives' freedom, Jane Roy and Glenn Pearson. I looked in the phone book and called them. Jane answered on the first ring. Thus began the adventure, one that would last for over a decade. I hopped a bus to London, I was living in Toronto at the time, and I went to Jane's and Glenn's house. They were running, and still continue to run, a nonprofit called Canadian Aid for South Sudan. They told me I could volunteer for their organization. It would be the only way to get me into the country at the time, as the war was still happening. So I took out a line of credit and bought my plane ticket. I flew into Twitch County, South Sudan, a rural area that had been battling this war for decades that I'd only just heard of. And I would be staying in the compound of a larger NGO and would be able to do my research during the day. In this story, the main characters, Sandra and Adut, meet by chance. Their meeting changes both of their lives significantly and irrevocably. Lacking cell phones, the internet, or any kind of modern communicative devices, they attempt to connect with each other through storytelling and their imaginations through space and time as a way of trying to move forward to heal and to justify what happened to them in their brief meeting. So these characters had these strong voices inside of me and they were insistent about connecting to one another. They needed to connect to each other. When I went to Sudan, by the time I went to Sudan, Adut and Sandra already <coughs> existed for me. I felt them, I knew them. I was very clear about not going there to find their representations. What I strove toward was researching Adut's world so that I could write her background and her environment and her situation as genuinely as possible. I felt as though I knew her essence, which transcended, transcended her culture and her experiences, and her inner en engine to which I had access is what I drew upon while writing her. But I needed to fill in these huge holes of her culture and her society and her role in her community. I read scads of books and articles before and after my trips to Sudan, and I befriended many South Sudanese people, not only in Sudan, but all over the world while I was writing this book. I did my best while in Sudan to smell what Sandra and Adut would have smelled, to fear as much as possible what they would have feared, and to eat what they would have ate. I observed. I absorbed. When I went there in 2003, the first time, this is what I saw. I saw women pounding grain. Everywhere I went, there was this sound, a, a heavy, rhythmic thudding of a type, type of grain called dura being pounded into meal for eating. I saw women carrying heavy bags of grain on their heads, walking for miles in the intense heat of day, coming back from market or going there to sell the grain that they grew. I saw women building or repairing their tukuls. This woman is building the the roof of a tukul. The, the tukul is the hut that is just behind her. This woman is repairing her tukul. As you can see, she's quite pregnant. This is a woman. Oh, there she is. She's still there. Sitting there repairing the tukul. And this is a woman standing outside her home. With her little boy behind. I saw, everywhere I went, women working morning to night, usually with a baby strapped to them or a toddler nearby. What I came to understand from observation after a few weeks is that these women looked to be upholding their culture and their families in the midst of this never-ending war through their work and their roles in their communities. I wanted to interview and speak to as many women as I could while I was there, but I immediately came up against a difficult obstacle. None of these women who surrounded me spoke English. I couldn't communicate with them. Strangely, this is not something I thought would be a problem before I left. <laughs> <laughs>
Jane had told me there would be lots of people there who spoke English. She didn't mention that it was only the men who spoke English. As soon as the Southerners built a school, like what you see here, I was told by the local people that the Northerners would come and bomb it. Soon after, however, classes would pop up under trees taught by volunteers in the community. This is a photo of some girls in class outside. The girls in this rural area were often taken out of school early to help at home and then married soon after their menses began. This is the reason that none of the women or girls I spoke to could speak English very well. I hired a translator, Mangok, a young man who was educated and could speak and understand English quite well. Most of the men there were educated and spoke English. And I saw that though these women who proliferated the landscape around me, who were everywhere, and who, who outnumbered the men because so many of them had been lost to war, had voices. Of course they had voices. In fact, they spoke a lot haggling at the market, running their households, giving orders to and disciplining their children. Did they just seem silent because I couldn't understand them? But that wasn't it, I realized. Their silence was not from not speaking. It's that they were excluded from the main narrative. They were excluded from most of the stories the men were telling me about their experiences in war during, the, during my interviews, as well as from the narrative of popular culture. The Lost Boys come to mind. Has anyone heard of The Lost Boys? and the, the, the related movie and documentaries. And Dave Egger's famous in, uh, an incredible novel, What is the What? Has anyone read What is the What? It's, in, it's incredible. <clears throat> all of these featured men suffering, their killing, their being killed, all the unspeakable horrors of war. But the women's voices remained somewhat absent. Where were the lost girls? Edith's desire to speak, her insistent desire to tell her story to me, made even more sense to me here. For here I saw that in her environment she wouldn't have had a loud voice. And besides the obstacle of language, I was realizing at this time that there was another looming barrier. These women I saw around me worked relentlessly. They were working for their survival, trying to eke water and food from the land, not only in the middle of a war that had destroyed their communities and infrastructure, but in the midst of a drought as well. When I began interviewing them through my translator, I wondered somewhat guiltily, but I think also realistically, if they were curtailing or censoring what they were telling me in interviews, as my translator was male and what they told me had to necessarily pass through him. I had begun taking informal Dinka language lessons by this time, but it wasn't enough. When I spoke, usually I'd get laughed at, but they could understand what I was saying, but I didn't have enough language to get into really in-depth conversations. I also felt cloistered within the grass walls of the compound that was housing me. I wanted to be nearer to these women who surrounded me, whom I couldn't reach. I knew I needed to make a deeper connection in order to do the proper research for my novel. I wanted to be beside them, without the men, without my translator. I wanted to know them better so I could understand my character's background better. My desire to leave the compound was growing. My desire to move out into one of the surrounding villages to be amongst the local people was getting stronger. I was restless. But this sort of thing, this moving out and away from compounds, wasn't done, I was told. The NGO authorities strongly advised me to stay in their compound because otherwise I wouldn't be protected in case of a raid. As I tried to figure out what to do, I continued observing the people surrounding me. I continued doing interviews during the day when I could leave the compound with my translator or a guard. There were lots of kids, always lots of kids around. Um, usually the, sibling, the older siblings were taking care of the younger <coughs> siblings. They would chase me and ask me to teach them English. These are kids near where I was staying, in, sorry, in Moon Rock. Now I never did learn the the name of this game or the rules, but they played it all the time. And they didn't have a lot to work with. They didn't have any toys. These are um, rubber tubes, the in, inner tubes of, uh, of wheels, I think, and they just played with them all afternoon. They would actually take my garbage. Um, for example, I had a, 
a cardboard box with mosquito spray in it. They took, they would take my cardboard boxes and make cars out of them. This is a boy taking his cow across the river. Cattle are very, very um, important to this agrarian uh, society. And there are two seasons in Sudan, the wet season and the dry season. This is just at the beginning of the dry season because the river is quite swollen. About a week after this, a crocodile came and took a cow down in this river, in this spot. This boy isn't wearing clothing. A lot of the older, even the older kids just wouldn't have clothes, so they would <clears throat> go naked. Um, <clears throat> cattle are extremely important to the South Sudanese. When a young man is courting a woman, he would in incorporate the color of his favorite cow into the song, and parents would name their children after the color of their favorite bull. And a lot of villages were named after the color of of cows. Cattle. This is a spear man. He made spears and went from cattle camp to cattle camp and village to village and sold them. The cattle camps are, um, you can see behind him, that's a cattle camp. Families and clans would stay with the cattle and roam with the cattle for months and make sure they had food and water. The cattle weren't, kill, weren't killed for meat, they were just used for their milk unless they died of old age. This is a young boy. He just he has fresh scars on his forehead as part of his adolescent rite. <clears throat> so part of the adolescent rite is to have an elder dip a, a knife in hot water and make these markings in the forehead, and, and you must not cry when that is done to you. It, is, uh, it shows your strength as a man. And they also do this to girls, though it was rarer. I, I saw these markings on, on the young women much less. I just think it's really ironic that his, his <coughs> shirt says, Boys to Men. <coughs> I didn't notice that until I brought it home. <clears throat> and that's a leader of a cattle camp, and that's his, his bull, which he's very proud of, and he needed me to take that picture. <laughs> <laughs> They're fishing. Those boats are made from local quail trees, and um, the, because of the drought, the fish were tiny, and that man there is laughing. He's making jokes about how small the fish are. Their sense of humor was incredible in the midst of everything they were going through. There's a boy uh, letting his cattle have a drink. A young girl in the cattle camp milking a cow. There's, these are all girls here in this cattle camp. Sisters. They're burning uh, dung um, to keep the flies away. A hungry little boy. There's me a long time ago. <laughs> That's in the, in the kitchen. Of the, that hugs the kitchen. By this time, I'd been in South Sudan for about six weeks, and I finally decided to make the move, despite the strong discouragement from the NGO I was stationed with. My translator found a family I could stay with for a few weeks, a Sudanese People's Liberation Army commander and his five wives and children. But this was at my own risk. There was a ceasefire, but we had been hearing noise of skirmishes north of us. In fact, the Darfur genocide began that very month that this picture was taken. Darfur is the same distance from where I was in Turalay <clears throat> as Saskatoon is from Regina. Though we couldn't really communicate very well through language at first, I learned a lot from these women. To my right, we can't see very well as the head wife. Um, so she's the first wife that was married, so she's considered to be the boss of the household. And then the girl on my left is someone that came in and helped with the cooking. So I learned a lot from them. I lived with them briefly. Um, I became a part of their lives and their daily activities as much as I could. And, and, um, and these are the children. These are some of, some of the commander's kids who followed me around daily. And you guessed it, demanded that I teach them English. <laughs> of course, it was the least I could do. And they learned quite a lot. So this is me with three of the wives and one of the kids. I was by now learning a lot about the politics and the history and the language and the culture. I was having a lot of conversations with elders, uh, men who were really filling me in on a, on a lot of things. And I, I was gaining this deep and unexplainable love for the place and the people. Um, 
but I still, of course, had my story to think of. And a dude, one of my main characters, was taken as a slave for eight years. And though I had interviewed several returned captives, and, and I had by that time interviewed several family members of people taken, I really felt that I still needed to go further. I wanted to meet a slave in captivity. And I was told again that this would be impossible. But my translator, Man Gok, came through for me yet again. Man Gok worked for VSF, Veterinaires Sans Frontières, Veterinarians Without Borders, as, um, as his other job. And the only time the northerners would lay down their guns for the southerners to cross into their, cross into their territory was if the VSF was with them and brought along vaccinations for their cattle because cattle are just as important to the northerners as they are to the southerners. And so Mangog said, I could meet a slave in captivity. He would need to get um, permission from his, boss of the, from his boss at VSF first. And his boss thought about it and made me swear to never tell anyone uh, their names um, of the people who were allowing me to go. But I, they allowed me to go, and I went along with them on this two-day trek to the north. And this is a picture of some boys right near the front lines. There's, and so we came to the place. We finally got to the place, and there's some soldiers there. These are uh, southern, southern Sudanese soldiers. And that's uh, Commander. The man to his right is with VSF. He was the boss of VSF. And we're waiting for, and there's just a boy, just a random child hanging around. And there's, uh, we're waiting for the northerners to come. We weren't going to do any vaccinations. They weren't going to do any vaccinations. They were just going to set up a time and a place, and there would have to be some negotiations, because things were just so political, just so tense, so politically tense. So we waited quite a while, and then pretty soon, um, <clears throat> these figures came loping over the horizon, and it was just two young men, probably 20. Um, they're from the, the north. They're northerners. They didn't, to me, look that much different than these guys. They look, they're a bit shorter. Maybe their skin was a bit lighter. Um, and they had with them a Dinka boy who was clearly their slave, and he was leading the, uh, the camel. I shouldn't say boy, because he was 21. This is him. He'd been taken when he was four. His village had been raided and his family killed. And they took him when he was four, and he's now 21. Um, so I was allowed to speak with him through my translator for five minutes. I was given five minutes with him. And uh, he just had that smile that you see there on his face the whole time. And he just said, this is my life. I, I, you know, I said, do you want to escape? Can you escape? And he said, no, where would I go? My family's gone. He couldn't even speak Dinka anymore. He could, could only speak Arabic. And he said, I have nowhere to go. I'm, I'm married now. I'm married to a girl who's also a slave in the cattle camp. Um, <coughs> they've given me one of the cattle to look after. I'm really, really good with the cattle. Now, of course, they haven't given him a cattle, any cattle. They just let him think that he owned the cattle that he took care of. Um, and he just kind of smiled. And, and he had taken on the, you know, <clears throat> the beliefs and the, the, the religion of, of his captors and became a, he had become a part of them. Um, right at the end of our meeting, when we were, I was getting the dirty look from the commander to come back, I, I knew I'd, I could ask him one more question. And I just said, what about if peace comes? Because they'd been talking about peace. There was talk at that time in 2003 of a peace accord being signed. And then he stopped smiling for the first time. And he said, they've been talking about peace coming for a long time. And that was it. That was our conversation. So on the way back, I was pretty depressed, wondering, you know, as these people are, will this ever end? Will this ever end? We got back to the village, and this is what we came for. Women yodeling and celebrating. And when I asked, I asked why they were celebrating, I was told that twins had just been born. I soon began to understand that the men were wary of me. I couldn't figure out why at first, but as they started to trust me more and as they began to see that I wasn't interested in changing them or telling them what to do in exchange for food or books or mosquito nets, but instead that I desperately wanted to learn from them and learn about them, when they finally believed this was the case, they became more open with me and specifically about my communication with the women. 
They told me that they were very concerned that I would introduce new ways to them, Western ways, and that the foundation of their culture would crumble. In fact, I had more than one man come up to me and say, don't change our culture. Their exact words. They'd seen it happen with a few girls that they allowed to go away to school in, in Kenya or other countries. They told me that they learned Western ways and then got pregnant out of wedlock or ran away with someone from another culture. I began to understand that they didn't want me to infect their women with my ideas. Perhaps they were happy that it was difficult for me to talk to them. However, I was beginning to communicate with the women more and more without the help of my translator. I was beginning to cobble together basic sentences with the little Dinka I knew and the little English they knew, and with a lot of hand gesticulations, sometimes we would have these full conversations. The men understood all too well that the women were the foundation of their culture. They understood that the women were keeping it all together as the North threatened to extinguish them. When I had asked upon my arrival if there were any women who spoke English that first week, I was told that Mama Victoria, would be a good woman to speak to because she could speak perfect English. But she was away. However, upon my return from my trip up north, she had just come back. I came upon Mama Victoria trying to help a young girl who had become suddenly paralyzed. This young girl could still breathe, but she couldn't move her limbs. Her brother brought her to Mama Victoria, and Mama Victoria had arranged for her to be flown out by one of the aid planes to Kenya for treatment. Mama V was in her 60s. She wore skirts and running shoes. She worked for the World Health Organization, traveling to the villages in area on foot and administering vaccinations to children as well as taking care of the ill. Mama Victoria sat down with me for an entire day and spoke to me about her life, about her culture, about the war, about women. She was educated under the British during colonization. She told me, I was the last generation of women to learn to speak English so well. When the British pulled out in the 50s, the war with the Northerners began and hasn't really stopped since. It is not only because women are pulled out of school to help at home and get married young that they are not as educated as the men. It is because we have all been running from the Arabs all these years and the women's education has become low on the list of priorities. She shook her head at this, clearly not agreeing with it. She believes in education for all, especially women and young girls, she told me. She got married young and had four children before her husband died in the war. She stayed nine years alone before accepting a marriage to her dead husband's brother, which is the custom in that area. She raised her children and got them all sent away for an education. Her children's education was a huge priority to her. She trained in the army and went to nursing school to become a nurse. She had an incredible life. When I asked her opinion on the custom where she must marry her husband's brother or the custom of polygamy practiced there, surprisingly she told me she agrees with both traditions and she is part of the male elders' voices who decry young women who rebel against these customs. When I asked her why this is, especially considering she is clearly a feminist and possibly the strongest woman I had ever met in person, after all, she was the only woman to train under John Garang, who was the former head of the South. And she put herself through nursing school while raising four children, getting them all to receive an education, all of this in the middle of a war. She even woke up every morning and went jogging on the airstrip before beginning her daily duties. She said that what is important is that her people continue on. I asked her what she meant. She said to me, my people are being annihilated and destroyed. Millions of us have died. Millions more have left or have been displaced due to a war that will not stop. We must continue on, our names must be carried on, and the way to do that is to accept marriage into the same family as your dead husband's brother so you can continue having children in his name, and also to accept your husband taking many wives so that you can have more sisters and more children through them. The family unit is what is important. The continuation of our people is what is necessary. I told her that I had spoken to several rural women, and when asking them what they thought of their husbands taking more wives, most of them looked at me, exhausted, and said, yes, I want him to take more wives, I need help. There's too much work. In the compound of the family I stayed with for a few weeks, there were five wives and many children. I was unsure of whose child belonged to whom until my last week. One of the wives never had children, but she treated the others as her own. One of the daughters, a teenager, had a baby, and that baby was taken care of by all the women. The wives addressed each other as sister, and the children called the mother's auntie. There were issues, of course, but there I also observed sisterhood and laughter. 
All the work these women were doing, the babies they were having and raising, the survival that they encouraged, that they demanded for their families and communities, all of this was keeping their people together. Their job was the biggest of all. They were keeping their culture and their people alive, a culture that had been experiencing decades of devastation and was continuing to experience slaughter. These women appeared in the margins. They appeared in the periphery. When I would sit down to eat, for example, I would eat with the men and the women would bring food and eat, then go away and eat together inside, away from us. They didn't eat with, with, with us. Men were clearly dominant there. They were clearly the bosses, the leaders. However, I did note that Mama Victoria commanded respect with her presence, with both men and women alike. This was due to, as I understood it, her elder status, the fact that she was educated, her history, and her role as a nurse in the area. It was clear to me and to the men who voiced it to me, the women were essential. They were holding their world on their backs, literally. Water, babies, food, shelter. They were giving their dying people life. The women here in this land were the lifeblood of their people. I read this theme, I, I wrote this story to experience connection. I only realized that after writing the story that that's the reason I did all of this crazy stuff. I wrote this story to experience connection. I have read this theme of connection versus disconnection in many stories and poems. It's very common. I am you, you are me, experiencing our similarities, our humanity. This is what I did with Adut and Sandra. It's essentially that basic. I was interested in how Adut and Sandra are the same. The thematic focus that kept me rooted to the core of this story, this feeling that I kept a tether to so I could sink down and access it, even when I wasn't writing, even when I was being too scared to write because I didn't want to go back there in my head again, or I was being too lazy to write. There was always this need, this, this overwhelming desire for connection that manifested in the hunger for a dude and Sandra con to connect to one another. Their desire to connect to each other and all the barriers that went along with that desire was the same impulse that, for me as a writer, kept me connected to the work. I translated my own human desire for connection into their desire, in a way. I saw or felt it as a line between them, a rope they were always trying to make and touch each other with. Indeed, they only meet once, and in this story, they don't know each other's names. As I said, they don't have each other's cell phones or email addresses. They only have their imaginations and the very powerful act of storytelling. My experiences and my research are reflected in the novel in many ways. I listened acutely to how the people spoke, their inflections of speech, their expressions, what they wore, what they ate. I took in the environment, the smells, the food. I absorbed as much as I could of their worries and of their lives. Just like anyone who chooses to write from a different cultural perspective, I was very aware of the risks, and I thought long and hard about it. I risked offending the very people who were so excited about my book and helped me, do, helped me to do research when I was there. I risked offending them by getting something wrong that showed I missed something deep and essential about their culture. I'm a fiction writer because for me, writing fiction is about mirroring reality as best as I can. As Samuel Martin says, it is to strive to make an artful window through which to see elsewhere, creating a world apart from this world, yet integrally linked to it. I knew I would miss things, no matter how much I researched, no matter how long I lived there, no matter how many people I interviewed, just as I would miss things writing from the point of view of an elephant, or a gay man, or a young boy growing up in Missouri. For me, this story, and the stories I will continue to write, is about the act of intending connection. I listened to the women's stories as they were, not how I wanted them to be. In connection, there is power and transformation. This is why I write. To me, the intrinsic truth of my story is about more than slavery and war. It's about the need for human connection. It's about the empowerment and disempowerment of women. It's about loss. It's about identity. It's about transformation through suffering. These are deep, essential, and ongoing truths which I attempted to communicate in this novel. I strove to delve deeper beyond a dude's history and culture and into her humanity. I read to explore the human condition to make an empathic leap into other characters' lives, to expand my mind, to glean compassion for others, to evolve. <coughs> if we had to limit ourselves only to what we know, we would lose thousands of books in the literary canon. 
I believe in the power of story and its ability to transform. This is why I write. We need women in stories as main characters, whom we care about, with names, speaking to each other and not only about men. For story, as we know, changes and forms and inspires our world. Story shapes us and it shapes our world. Thank you. <laughs> I believe there's a question and answer period, is that right? Okay. <laughs> to the people I know over there. Uh, so far, there's, there's, uh, there's a new war that's begun now. There's a lot of violence going on, so I haven't really been in contact. In fact, my translator died in January from the new, in, the new, in the new violence, and I know he just received a copy of my book, and I don't know if he read it. I'll never know if he read it. Yeah, so it's really, um, yeah. Um, I, I have a few uh, Sudanese friends who I know have read it, but it's, there's no movement right now that, that I know. My other question is probably just sort of odd. I just, um, I didn't see in any of the pictures any like, really elderly people. And is, is, is the life expectancy quite like low or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, there are elders. I, maybe I just didn't include any except for Mama Victoria. But yeah, there's, it's, you know, they're dying younger there, if not from the war, then from disease. So there's, there definitely aren't as many, there weren't as many older people as there were kids. There were lots of kids around. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. So uh, Mama Victoria has this esteem to her because she's educated and as a nurse, and yet, um, the population do not want that for the for the women now. I mean, would they benefit from having more nurses? Or yes, yes. Um, in 2011, they voted to separate to become their own their own country, and at that time, there were several girls only schools that popped up, and a lot of um, the Sudanese left the country during the war, but. In 2011, they came back to help rebuild the country. And as they came back, they came back with, with new ideas and, and inspiration from having lived elsewhere. And so a lot of Sudanese men um, really want, they also want now, even more than 10 years ago when I was there, from what I understand, they really want their girls to have an education and to be educated and to not marry young. In fact, there is this movement, There's um, there's even a Facebook page, and I know this because I have a lot of Dinka friends that um, started about don't let our girls, and this is started by men, don't let our girls marry so young, let them get educated, etc. So there is definitely that um, being woven woven into the rest of it. Can I just, on your photographs, you showed um, a lot of women and a lot of men, but I didn't see any women and men together. I hardly saw any women and men together either. Yeah, the, they really stayed separate. It, I mean, if they were together, it was it was often adolescents who shouldn't have been, who were <laughs> behind a tree or behind something whispering or, you know, trying to stay out of everybody's, or or you know, the children and moms and sisters and brothers and things like that. But no, I hardly saw that. Dudes still talk to you. Sorry? Does dude, is that the name of your character? Adut. Adut, does she still talk to you? No, not like she did. Um, once the book was published, her voice got a lot quieter. And then these new characters came in for my second book, and now they're really loud. <laughs> um, she's, I mean, she exists, but she's on the page now. 
I don't think I could access her the same way anymore. Um, th uh, first, thanks for your talk. It, um, it brings up a lot of really thorny questions, and, and you sort of allude to those at the end of, of your talk uh, on the topic of risks. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering about one of the risks of reproducing a kind of knowledge gathering that is sort of mapped onto a familiar epistemology of a mobile, privileged uh, producer, consumer of information as against a static, underprivileged subject of information that's bound up in the kind of colonial discourses that are at stake here thematically. And so I'm wondering, were you conscious of that risk? And to what degree do you think you were able to negotiate it? I was very conscious of that risk. And I guess I negotiated as best as I could. I knew that, as I said, I knew that there would always be those questions, and there will always be those questions, especially if the book did well. And I knew that that would always be a part of it, that that co potential controversy would always be a part of this story, and that it should be, and it must be, and these questions must be asked along with the story. Um, and, and in that, hopefully, change happens or, or learning or some kind of forward movement or, or, or intellectual evolution goes on with that, goes along with that. As a follow-up to that, you know, this, this term of public intellectual has been circulating and I'm wondering about how you imagine your public. Or what's the makeup of the public? Who is the public? Who because, reads my books, you mean? Well, I mean, is that, is that, is that it? I mean, because it strikes me as part of the question that I'm asking is that, you know, I'm, I'm learning about this book on a university campus in an art gallery with a group of English professors. Uh, and is that the makeup of the public that is the source of, as, you know, as you're describing, it, change? I have, I have no idea. I think, I think, <coughs> I don't think of, uh, I don't think of myself as a public intellectual, but I was really happy that Marie mentioned that. Um, I just think as a writer, I think of myself as a writer. I'm a storyteller, and I'm not even sure who my readers are before the story is published. I start to understand who my readers are after it's published, when I engage with them. <coughs> when I engage, after I engage with them, when I begin to engage with my readers, I learn more about the story myself. Because I think it's an organism, it's, and it's always changing, it's always evolving, because we all bring something different to it, and that's as it should be, story. Yes? Are you still in touch with Mama Victoria? No, but um, she's an aunt to one of my good friends, and so I, I hear about her. I hear about what she's doing. She's, uh, she's in Kenya, right? She's in Kenya right now. Yeah, she's doing good. Um, I'm from Colombia. We have had um, an internal armed conflict for over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a graduate student in the psychology department. I'm, a, I'm going to be doing my research with displaced women. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in the process of writing a proposal right now. I'm hoping to go back to Colonia over the summer to interview um, my participants, uh, who will be displaced women from rural areas that moved to the cities. Uh -huh. and yeah. I'm going to be doing research on their parenting experiences and the challenges and facilitators that they face while they're trying to integrate to an urban context. Um, and um, so it was very interesting to to hear your like the research that you did in order to write uh, your story. And I was just wondering um, when you talked to these women, were they presenting themselves as victims or more as agents? And I ask this question because. Um, in the process of writing my proposal, then of course I had to read tons of papers and you know literature on the subject. Mm -hmm. And um, usually you find this binary of um, mm -hmm. like victimhood, victimhood or agency. Um, and of course it, it depends on the background of one kind of like the scholarly work uh, work that you're reading. Mm -hmm. But um, I was just wondering, out of your own experience. Um, what were you able to tell me that? I think having uh, gotten to know them, that it depended on who they were talking to. Mm -hmm. They were in survival mode. So if they thought that 
I was there to, to give them something, they would present themselves more to me as victims in our conversations. But as I got to know them better, and they saw I was kind of sticking around and I wasn't leaving, um, then I got to know they were, these were incredibly strong, uh, unbelievably strong people who were trying to keep their families alive. So I think they changed depending on who they were talking to. But really, um, in terms of how they presented themselves, they were just trying to stay alive. So they presented themselves however they needed to in or for survival. First of all, your presentation was really very interesting. And I haven't uh, read your book, but I, I became very curious to read your book. Uh, as you said that uh, you were, I mean, um, they treated you as an outsider and they said that uh, don't change our culture. And I got curious to read your book because I really want to see what was your strategy to talk about all of this gender discrimination without hurting their culture. <laughs> Right? Because you have to talk about women's education, mm -hmm. polygamy, all of these issues you have to bring out in your novel. Yeah. But I'm not sure, I mean, what would be the strategy to talk about all of those issues without hurting their culture? So are you asking how, uh, how I, what did I do so as, so as to not hurt their culture? No, my question is that anyhow, I mean, um, if you talk about all of those discrimination, then they would say that who the hell you are, you are talking oh. about all of those issues, this is our culture. Polygamy, yeah. that's my culture. We are not allowing our women not to go to school or to learn English, that's our part of our culture. So my, my question is that then as a writer, you have some ethics, right? Right? Like maybe what is the role of the writers? Writers, they need to, they need to, they want to make some changes through their writings, right? So what was your stand? I mean, how well, did as you... A, as a writer, my characters yeah. come first. <coughs> so Adut wasn't thinking polygamy was bad. Adut was just a part of her culture. I just needed to learn about her culture and her within it and bring that to the page as, as best as I could. Um, and, and, as, and, as, and as I said, in terms, of, in terms of writers changing things, I think we, we do, we do, but it's not even direct. There's a transformation that happens simply by connecting, by me connecting to my characters and by somebody else connecting to my characters as well. And so all I needed to do was present this situation as realistically as I could and their, their obstacles and their traumas and their own personal transformation as genuinely as I could. Does that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> yes. You said you just came to have like, a connection and a love for the place and you couldn't really describe it. Um, can you kind of try? Like, what was it that you found attractive? Like, coming from a Canadian um, <coughs> point of residence, I guess, and then going somewhere that's so different, um, is there anything that you kind of wish you could? bring from that culture back to here, or like way of life? Oh yeah, um, I mean, their sense of community. Um, and their joy, their, it seemed really pure for some reason, I don't, I don't know why, and um, connection to the land, it's really visceral. Um, Their identity, I think, is what struck me the most. That they seemed to know who they were so acutely. I, I asked a little boy what his name was, and, and he was about three, two or three. And he told me his name, and then he told me his father's name, and then his grandfather's name, and his great grandfather's name, his great great grand. And he went, he went on like 11, like 11 or 12. Like he's so. They just are solid. They were just solid, um, just so solid with who they were in their place on that plot of earth. And really, um, their family.
family unit was really, really strong. I mean, it was very wide, but it, but they knew everybody. They knew what everybody was doing, and and I think that's something that's been lost, or just maybe it it just doesn't exist here. We're all pretty isolated, and yeah, that's not so materialistic. Well, yeah, I mean, there were there were it's impoverished here, obviously, but yes, there are more, here we're more. Um, tunnel vision, I think, to get our own, towards our own goals. But it was also, um, the land was beautiful. The people were amazing, dignified. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes? No, I mean, so thank you for the I really like an interesting presentation. I'm one of your readers. <laughs> Thanks. So, okay, but for the person who was wondering who are your readers, um, I'm also a writer, and I'm working on a novel that has four women in it. I never thought I was maybe writing a feminist piece of work, maybe I am. Um, a couple questions. One is about uh, structure. And I'm curious, as a writer, did you know the end point, or did you only have a starting point when you began to set and stories? I just had a starting point. It was exploration as I went. Are you surprised by how the novel came out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. In fact, I thought there was going to be one ending for a couple months there, and I wrote it. I finally wrote it. It was April, and I just sent it to Lisa Moore, who's my thesis advisor, and then I went back to bed, and I was breastfeeding my newborn, and then the, new, the real ending came to me. <laughs> and then I went, it was like three in the morning, and I went back and I wrote the real ending, and then that was, and then I sent it off the next morning to Lisa. Yeah, I was really surprised by it. Cool. Um, and my final question has to do with permission. We've spent a lot of time, I'm in the MFA, right? Mm -hmm. And we've had conversations about does a writer require permission to tell the stories of the people that she's writing about, even if they are not, even if it's fiction? Mm -hmm. So what are, you, what are your thoughts about that, and did the women and men that you spoke with, were they clear about what your, your project was, that it wasn't journalism, that it was fiction? Yes, I made that very clear. I, tried, I, I attempted to make that very clear when I was there, um, and I told everyone who was helping me what I was doing, and as well as my friends back here in Canada who were helping me, I told them as well, and everyone was super, really, really on board with it. I think part of the reason they were so on board with it was because they were in the middle of war and they just wanted the war to end and they wanted people to see to see them. They wanted to be heard and nobody was listening to them for decades. The international community didn't even, you know, most of the international community wasn't even aware of their war until the Darfur genocide. So when I was there, most people didn't even know what was going on and it had been going on for decades. So they were just so hungry to be seen and to be heard that they were totally on board. And as a fiction writer, at the time, when I was doing the research, I couldn't tell them exactly what it was going to turn out to be. It's such an exploration, you can't, it's not a, here's a map, this is how I'm gonna write it and fill it in this line. No, it's so much more watery than that. Yes. I just wondered if you had any, um, first of all, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, any presumption, or, um, premonitions about what was going to happen in the South after, that there would be fighting afterwards, like having spent that time in the South, did you have any sense that this would happen? Well, I, I, first of all, I couldn't even, I couldn't believe that they were going to get the independent vote, or I thought that it was going to be corrupted, and but they did, and then after, you know, in the 2000, July 2011, it was in the news. South Sudan is now its own nation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I thought, oh, this is not going to last. The Northerners are going to come back in, and then they didn't. And then, and then I started to get my hopes up, and I thought, oh my God, they did it. And then just this year, war has begun again. Yeah, in December it started. December, December. So yeah. But now it's more tensions within the South itself, right? Yes. Yes. And so did you have any sense that those tensions were lingering? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. But I, they just wanted to be out of war so bad. I mean, just, they just wanted the war to stop. They could not keep going. They were dying left, right, and center. They just wanted peace so badly. 
and um, Mangok, my translator, who died in January, he said he just fought his whole life for peace from the north, from the north. And then he, he gets it, has it for two and a half years, and dies at the hand of his own people. Two and a half years later, it's just, I can't make any sense of it right now. I'm still in it. It's still happening. Yeah. Were there other books in particular that helped you write this story? Yes. Um, Francis Mading Dang, uh, he's from the south. He's from Twitch County. He uh, was a prof, I think, in Boston. He went to America and became a professor and a writer. And he wrote a lot of nonfiction books about his culture, which I read. So I read those books. And then, and then I read, you know, What is the What? and, and um, a few other books that didn't do as well by, by, um, by South Sudanese. Were there other fictions, not necessarily set in Sudan, that taught you anything? Um, I didn't actually start reading fiction set in, South, set in South Sudan until after I was, I mean, tweaking my final draft till I was working with my editor. So I'd have to say no. And I don't know that I'd want to read other fiction set in South Sudan at that time but because it might um, influence me too much and take away from my own story. I was reading other fi fictions that were set elsewhere for structure. I wanted to learn about structure, character development, things like that. But women from cross-cultural situations, were there any works like that that... You know, one I read after I was done writing mine was Little Bee by Chris Cleave, but that was after. That, 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 that was cross-cultural. <coughs> Set in North America, I won't get into any trouble. Probably, I might. I, you know, I probably will. But um, yeah, it's it's um, set in anywhere in North America. It's a double narrative again, but it's a sister and a brother. They're not talking to each other. Yeah. And I'm thinking about that all the time. Um, do you want to ask me the rest of your question later so that I can try to answer it? Yeah, because you said I only sure. started answering your question. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, when I introduced you, I mentioned something that stood out for me in the novel, and it um, it seems to me that there's two such moments, and you refer to one in your own life, where in the um, sort of circulation of relationships that participate in both the connection and the disconnection that you're exploring in your work. Um, there come these moments. So for you and for the uh, for Sandra, there's a McLean's article, right? There's a, there's a story about a situation that um, normally in the daily course of events would pass, mm -hmm. right? It would pass through the life. It would be, you know, another piece of news, right? But it doesn't pass in this case, right? It's arresting. Yes. And then there's also the moment where, as I mentioned, there's this harried graduate student, right, uh, who has many responsibilities, one of which is managing this grant yeah. that she needs to have somebody um, you know, carrying out the work of the grant, and so she, um, she and the protagonist make this arrangement, right? And in your talk, you talked about, you know, veterinarians without borders as well. So there's these kind of contingent moments mm -hmm. when, um, you know, this most tenuous connection, right, mm -hmm. begins, and you know, kind of works counter to all of that colonialist, um, separatist kind of um, capitalist discourse, right, that makes it um, so easy to say, 
us and them here and there, right? Yeah. So, you know, I read in that something about your intentional movement toward connection, but also something about um, kind of the accidental um, operations of these weird systems that we live in mm -hmm. that set us up in these weird oppositions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit to that. <laughs> Well, you've done it better than I could, probably. Um, <laughs> like I said, it was a lot of what was happening to me there, along with my desire to go there. You know, what ha what what happened to me before, during, and after was unconscious. Um, my experiences there inspire Sandra's experiences in the novel. She's not me, I don't really, you know, I feel like we're very different. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, it does speak, the way things are set up does speak to how connected we all are, even though we're constantly being told that we're, that we're not connected to each other. And, and it happens in everybody's lives where these strange things happen and they, they come about because of these systems that we've created. You almost override these, these systems that are meant to keep us apart in order to connect. But in Sandra's and Adut's situation, they do connect because of their brief meeting, but they also really desire to keep that connection going. They need to have someone to hear their words. And so they're sort of brought together and then pulled apart. And then I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. Or if that speaks to what you're saying. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. We have lots of goodies so that you can hang around and chat with Melanie. She's got books in the back that she'll sign. Uh, they're $21 each, cash or check. <laughs> and uh, please just enjoy uh, your company with each other and with Melanie for the next little while. Thank you.